Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only. Hello, and welcome to Coffee with Closers, a podcast featuring a team of public relations professionals at Pinkston in Washington, D.C. From media personalities to pioneers in healthcare and disruptors in business, we talk with some of America's most interesting people who tell interesting stories. So grab a cup of coffee and let's get started. This is Coffee with Closers. Our guest today is one truly unique and adventurous individual. Mark Tomlinson serves as administrator of the Pitcairn Islands, a remote British territory in the South Pacific that is just two miles long and one mile wide and has a population of about 50 people. Pitcairn is approximately 1,300 miles east of Tahiti and just over 4,000 miles from Panama. The current island residents are descendants from the mutineers of the British naval small merchant vessel, the HMS Bounty, and their Tahitian companions. A British diplomat for more than 20 years, Mark has served the interests of his country in many places around the world, including Mozambique, Saudi Arabia, the former Yugoslavia, India, South Korea, Iraq, Afghanistan, the United States, and now on Pitcairn Islands. Mark says his diplomatic ambitions were driven by a deep desire to live and work in exotic countries and do interesting things. Mark joins us today to talk about his responsibilities as administrator, the trajectory of his professional career, and daily life with his wife Marie on Pitcairn, which today is one of the few places in the world that hasn't had a single case of COVID-19. Mark Tomlinson is a closer. All right. Mark Tomlinson, how are you? Welcome to Coffee with Closers. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well, thanks. Steve, how are you? I'm doing great, doing great. Great to have you from all all the way across the world. Um, so we got a really great show. Let's let's dive right in. So, Mark, you you've spent the better part of your career um, in the British Foreign Service. Uh, your job has taken you all over the world. You've been to Mozambique, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and now you are uh, what what maybe could be your last assignment, I guess we don't know, in one of the most remote parts of the world, uh, Pitcairn Island. It is uh, two miles long, one mile wide, and has a population of about 50. Uh, So what motivated you and your wife to give up uh, some of the finer things in life to take on this uh, arduous adventure? Yeah, sure. Well, my previous job to this was actually in Washington, D.C., at the British Embassy there, where I was covering strategic threats and Middle East affairs between 2016 and 2020. So, you know, that was a bit of a roller coaster. Um, And quite frankly, not much, not much beats that Um, in the world of diplomacy. That was a it was that was a great gig, Um, but it was pretty taxing as well. And after that, I needed something completely different. And uh, this is certainly yeah. completely different. And actually, I can partly blame my wife because as it works in the Foreign Service, when the jobs come available, you know, um, they came up and I was going, no, that's a bit boring. That's a bit boring. Don't do that. That's a bit boring. I said, none of these are really out there or interesting except for Pitcairn Islands. And nobody would really go there. And she said, why? <laughs> we had a discussion. And in the end, I put my put my name forward. And here we are. Oh, that's yeah, that's that's excellent. So tell our listeners, uh, just at a high level, where is Pitcairn Island located in the South Pacific? And then the second part of that question is, um, what are your just at a high level? What are your day to day responsibilities on the island? What are you in charge of? Okay, yeah. So geographically, it as you mentioned in your introduction, it's one of the most remote communities in the world. It's um. Th- equidistant between Chile and New Zealand. So it's 3,000 miles from New Zealand one way and 3,000 miles for, to Chile in the other direction. It's just below the Tropic yep. of Capricorn. So that's kind of opposite to Hawaii on the other side of the equator. 
Um, the nearest actual land, if you go east, it's Easter Island, but that's quite a way away. And then the other side is French Polynesia, but the only continents, as I said, South America one way and sort of Australia, New Zealand the other way. So it takes two weeks on a ship just to get here from, from New Zealand. Um, wow. And it's, as you said, tropical island right in, the mid, right in the middle of the Pacific. It's about five kilometers deep all around. Um, and day to day, my, my life um, here, so I'm the British government, uh, it's called the administrator on the island, basically the sole British government representative here on the island. I mean, they've got self-governance to a degree. They've got an island council. Um, but I'm head of, so I'm on that island council along with the mayor and deputy and the councillors. Um, I'm also head of the mm -hmm. Pitcairn Public Service. I'm also the Pitcairn Court Registrar. So I do all those sort of bureaucratic mm -hmm. types jobs, but it's um, basically pursuing what our goals are here, which is partly around good governance, also about making the most of the environment on the island. I mean, we've got a spectacular environment, big marine reserve. We can come onto that later. Um, so yep. yeah, my, my jobs, I mean, today, for example, let me think, what have I been doing today? Today, I've been talking about trying to get vaccine boosters to the island. Um, you can imagine oh, you know, wow. being so remote, trying to get vaccines all the way from the UK to, to Pitcairn's kind of challenging. We got vaccines earlier this year, um, but we're trying to get boosters here now. Um, I've been trying to liaise about a possible visit by a British Royal Navy ship at some point. Um, we've been talking about whether to build a science base on the island. Plus, there's all the day-to-day -day many myriad of administrative issues that come on an island of people coming to my door and talking about the latest small issue that might be affecting somebody on the island. Mm, okay, so you're a you're a teacher, police officer. You're everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, we actually have. That's an interesting so, point. We actually, I'm not the only um, person who doesn't, who's not permanently living on the island. So we do have a policeman. He's seconded from the New Zealand police. We have a school teacher. She's mm -hmm. also from New Zealand. We have a doctor. Actually, they're all from New Zealand at the moment because of COVID restrictions. That's the only real transit route we have. The island's only open to New Zealand at the moment on our, the government controlled supply ship. It's the only route on and off the island. So we have a New Zealand policeman, teacher, doctor, and social worker. They're all funded by the UK government mm -hmm. and they work under me. And then the rest of it is the islanders who are 40, we're 43 in total at the moment. Okay, perfect, excellent. I think you answered one of our upcoming questions. Um, we'll get back to Pitt Karen in a minute. I wanna, I wanna turn to your life for a second. Um, you had quite mm. an interesting life. You, you, you spent your early, years in Hong Kong. I think that's where your father was stationed. You studied physics, at, uh, was at Southampton University. Uh, you were in finance for a little bit, and then you went to serve, uh, you know, your country. Um, that's quite an interesting path. Just can you walk us through the, through that change? Yeah. Well, my father, he was an engineer and he moved out to Hong Kong back in the fifties when we still had an empire and there were colonies all over the world. And he, he, he chose Hong Kong to be the one that he went and worked for something called the Colonial Service when it existed as an engineer. And he ended up being okay. a fairly senior member of the government in Hong Kong. So I guess I grew up in that, that context of British government service overseas in a way. And you can see a thread coming through to what I'm doing now. Uh, so he was he moved there in the 50s and me and my brothers and sisters were you know, out there and went to school out there. It was a great life. Um, the colonies all disappeared one by one, but happily Hong Kong remained, and obviously until 97, but certainly when I was young, it was still there. Mm -hmm. So I went to school out there. But when it came to university, there's not much option really of staying in Hong Kong. Um, so I went to university back in the UK, Southampton, as you said. I only did physics because I was good at it and seemed like an easy option. Um, wasn't so easy, but then yep. by the time I finished it, I thought, right, I'm, pro I'm probably not smart enough to be an actual research scientist or a rocket scientist, so I maybe have to go and earn a living. Um, but I don't really like living in the UK. I was born in the tropics in Hong Kong. Um, so, you know, mm -hmm. I like warm weather. So after university, I went back to Hong Kong, tried to make a life for myself there, and then realized that I needed to get rich. So, and that was back in the yuppie days that some of us remember in the late 80s, right? So. It was back to London, to the financial center of the world, and joined Lehman Brothers um, to make a go of it in that, in that world. Anyway, long story short, after about four years, I still wasn't rich. Um, I was still working long <laughs> hours at Lehman Brothers. I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't go into any details, but it was you know, the normal merchant banker type lifestyle, right? Um, but I, I said I still wasn't very rich. 
still didn't get any holidays working for an American firm. You know how tough they are. Um, so I thought, right, I need a change of life. I don't want to live in England. It's too cold. So my next love was I want to do a really interesting job, but I want to travel all over the world. And then, you know, one thing led to another. I joined, somebody mentioned the British Foreign Service. I thought, oh, they'll never let me in. Um, but they did. Um, so I joined and that was 20 something years ago. And I've spent all but two years since the mid 90s overseas. I've only been back to UK for two oh, years, wow. maybe even less than two years in that in that wow. whole 20 years time since 95. I left in 1995 as my first assignment overseas to, to Mozambique, just come out of a civil war back then. So that was a pretty tough environment. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, we went from there. You listed all the various countries I've been to, country to country culminating in the United States of America, which, as I said earlier, was a great experience and difficult to beat. And then the opposite over to Pitcairn. And so I guess oh, I've done great. this because, that's as you can great. see, you know, I like living in warm countries. I like, I like to live in cosmopolitan places. I like to meet people from different cultures. I like to do, like to do varied yeah. work. And it's certainly been all of that, certainly. Yeah. We could talk forever. <clears throat> that's incredible. You're one of the few people in the world who's had this job. I mean, it's it's amazing. Um, uh, how many administrators, by the way, how many administrators, what number are you? Do you know? On the island, I'm the fourth administrator yeah. of Pitcairn Island. We only started putting administrators here in 2014 or 15, I think. And coincidentally, actually, the okay. very first administrator on the island took over from me in a job in Afghanistan as head of political military affairs in Afghanistan back in, when was that, 2012, I think. He came to, he took okay. over from me there. And then a few years, then about a year or so later, I saw, wow, Alan's gone to Pitcairn. I wonder why he's done that. And then, you know, fast yeah. forward eight, eight years and I'm doing the same thing. <laughs> um, interesting. So speaking of administrator, and you said it started uh, not too long ago, but so just tell me a little bit, why why does the British government have an interest in maintaining a presence um, uh, in, on such a small, remote remote place of the world? Yeah, so um, for a long while, we administrated it, administrated it to the extent we did remotely, right? We had people in New Zealand or Australia who nominally had some responsibility for Pitcairn, but really Pitcairn was kind of self-governing. Um, and then mm -hmm. about 20 years ago, uh, there was um, Pitcairn came into the news for a certain reason, um, and also the money ran dry, and we had to start putting money into the into the territory to keep it going. Um, and now, to this day, Pitcairn survives on what we mm -hmm. call budgetary aid, grant and aid from the British government. Um, for its first couple of hundred years of existence, it didn't. You know, the Pitcairn is a resolute bunch, and you, we'll come onto that, and I expect in a minute the mutiny on the bounty and all that sort of stuff. But you know, they. They could look after themselves and fend it for themselves, but as we gradually got into the modern world, that became less and less possible. Um, and so, yeah, once we are, and we started assigning, mm -hmm. as I said, policemen here and doctors and teachers, we had to then put somebody in to govern all those strands, and that's the administrator. Before I, before they had administrators, they had a more junior person called a British government representative for about 10 years, I think, 10, 15 years, and then they upgraded it to a more senior position okay. as time went on. And the interests we have here are, Great. as I said, really ensuring good governance on the island, but also managing things like the environmental stuff that, you know, we've got one of the world's largest um, protected marine protected areas in the world, 800 and something thousand square mm -hmm. kilometers of protected marine marine um, area around all the Pitcairn Islands. So okay. there's, there's stuff to do on that as well. And, and are you, is your, um, do you, are there individuals on the other islands that make up the island chain or are you just on the main the main the mainland so to speak no the other so there's four islands in the group and only one is inhabited one of them called henderson the is a, a, a un uh, world heritage natural heritage site um the other two are small sort of coral, coral atolls but nobody lives on any of them but i've had the fortune of visiting them in september actually we took a Pitcairn Island led scientific expedition to all four islands and took underwater footage of the reefs and of the sea life there. Um, we did that ourselves because of all the travel restrictions because of COVID, you can't really get scientists out. 
Um, so we retasked that supply ship I mentioned, the one supply ship that's funded mm. by the British government that comes from New Zealand. It came here. Yeah. Um, me and uh, myself and a few of the islanders jumped on there. And we had all this equipment sent out from UK and we went to each island and put these cameras underwater and took some fantastic footage and counted, you know, did things like count the birds and nesting turtles and all that sort of stuff and took some data and then sent all that data back to the scientists in the UK. So I very, feel very lucky that I'm actually one of the few people in the world that's been to all four of the islands. Um, one of them, the furthest oh, wow. one, Ducey, it's 36 hours by boat away. So it's not even close. Wow. 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 That's amazing. Holy cow. Well, speaking of boats, um, uh, Pitt Karen, um, many of the descendants on the island are... Um, were part of a very famous and remarkable maritime history event that happened on April 28th, 1789, a mutiny on a favorite, fa famous ship. Can you talk to us a little bit about uh, that uh, f famous historical event and how, how the descendants sure, on the island sure. came to be? Sure, or infamous event in terms of British Navy history. So yeah, there was, yeah. A, there was a, sh a small ship called the um, HMS Bounty, which was tasked to go from the UK to Tahiti to collect breadfruit, which is a large fruit that still grows on Pitcairn after they brought it here, but it grows in the Pacific. And the idea was that that could be transplanted to the Americas um, as a new crop, you know, the sort of thing that used to do around then, you know, this is a good staple crop and it can be used to, over there. So Captain Bly, he was actually interesting. He had been on the voyage with Captain Cook when he had come down to the Pacific. So he knew the area. In fact, he was with Captain Cook when he was killed in Hawaii. Um, and then 10 years mm -hmm. later, Bly had the command of his own ship and he came, was sent here to, to Tahiti, sorry, not to here, to get these breadfruit. Long story short, they stopped, they had a really arduous journey. Um, there's, as you said, there's been a few f movies about it, um, including Mel Gibson as Fletcher Christian, I think, in one of them, but uh, it was yep. a tough journey. The crew got a bit unhappy. He was quite a strict disciplinarian. And they had like s several months on Tahiti preparing these plants and the sailors got used to the nice life there living with the natives and swimming in the sea and eating the fruit. And then after, when they set sail back to the Caribbean with these breadfruit, they last, didn't last very long until they had a mutiny against Bly. And they put him and half of the crew into the longboat, uh, set him adrift. And they turned tail and went back to Tahiti to pick up. A couple of them had girlfriends there. So they went back to Tahiti. Um, they stayed there for a bit. And then they realized they were going to be in big trouble, obviously, when the British Navy came to find them and get their ship back. So they sailed around for a bit looking for somewhere to live. And then eventually they chanced upon Pitcairn and a guy called Fletcher Christian who'd been one of the officers on, on board. He was he, he was in charge of the mutiny. You know, they got to Pitcairn. He realized it was actually in the wrong place on the British Admiralty charts by a few hundred miles. Mm -hmm. So he thought, you know, if I couldn't wow. find it, then they'll never find it. I guess that's what the link thinking was. So they ran it, they came ashore, decided it looked fertile enough. And then a few days later, they sank their only escape off the island, which was the HMS Bounty. They sank it in the bay here, and the remains are still they're still in the bay here, the anchors in the town square. Um, and they set oh, wow. up life here, and they'd brought with them a bunch of Tahitians. Uh, so I think there was nine mutineers and some Tahitian men and a, a bunch of Tahitian women came. And they settled here, and mm -hmm. then they didn't even get found for about 20 years. And eventually, it was an American ship that found them. American passing ship came and wow. found them and said, hey, what's this doing? Got the story, re reported it to the British, and we were involved in a war against Napoleon or somebody at the time, I think, and so we were distracted for a bit. And eventually, you know, by the time we sent a British Navy ship out here to see what was going on, there was only one mutineer survivor, a guy called John Adams, wasn't even his real name, but a guy called John Adams, uh, and a bunch of kids and a bunch of, um, of the Tahitian women were still left. And it was about 30 years on by then, and they said, well, what are we going to do? No point, you know, prosecuting him now. So they, so they let him, let him be. And then it wasn't even part of the British Empire for another couple of decades, a few decades, and eventually it got absorbed into the British Empire. And then fast forward, here we are. I so said we sort of left it to do its own devices for a while, for a long time. And then fast forward to where we are now. It, at the peak, it had a few hundred people, two, three hundred people at various times in its history. Uh, they've relocated the population a couple of times to other islands, but people have always come back again. And I said, now we're down. To, we're 43 currently at the moment on the island. Wow. And and what is the what is the ethnic makeup of of the of the 43? Yeah. So obviously the mutineer, all the mutineers, yeah, all the mutineers were British, mainly from I think Devon and Cornwall type area in in UK, and then the Tahitian women. 
Um, so that so to start with, it was half Tahitian, half British. That was for, like that for a long while. But over time, uh, various people have stayed, including some Americans. People have, you know, those whaling ships out from Nantucket or whatever, they've got, you know, those are pretty tough journeys as well. And sometimes people are allowed to jump ship and start, you know, jump off. And they, some, so some American whalers jumped off. And at the moment, we've got a few people from New Zealand who've joined, who've partnered up with, a, with Pitcairn as and come. And we've got a few Brits over the years who've come decide to make a life on Pitcairn. So ethnically, it's really British and Tahitian historically, plus a bit of intermingling yep. from, yep. I said, a few Americans. Wow, that's interesting. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about your journey to the island. Um, it's hard enough as it is, but you had to do it at the height of uh, a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic. Um, you and I talked about it uh, briefly before before you left. I think you had to fly to New Zealand and COVID and, and, and quarantine and the whole nine yards. Just at a high level, walk us through all that you and your wife had to go through to uh, to get there. Sure. So when we left FTC, we actually first had to go back to UK briefly. So we were there for a few weeks. So that meant quarantine in the UK and a couple of weeks of semi-freedom where we could go out. And then we had to leave UK and go to New Zealand. That's a 27-hour flight via Singapore. Uh, again, with all the mm-hmm. COVID restrictions that were on there, we had a brief stop in Singapore where we were you know, hustled into a little waiting area of infected people. Um, this was before vaccine days, right? So everybody was still wearing masks and hand sanitizer and masks on the flight the whole way. You know, it's 27 hours of wearing a mask on a plane and stuff. That, so that then we get to New Zealand. Oh. Then had a, we had then we had to go into forced, well, mandated quarantine in New Zealand in a hotel. You know, provided by the New Zealand government. That's proper quarantine. You know, proper quarantine. You weren't even allowed out your door. You know, they they would deliver food to the door and come and test you and swab you every now and then. And we lived in a hotel room for two weeks. Happily, it was a pretty nice hotel room, so it wasn't. I don't want to give you nice. it wasn't that much hardship. But you know, it's stuck in a hotel room for two weeks. Uh, then we had about a week or so out to do some basic stuff in New Zealand. New Zealand back then was COVID free, so it was that was I tell you that was luxury. You know, having been all the way through the states and the UK, where we had COVID since March 20 March, you know, this was now November, October, November. We'd been sick of lockdowns. Vac- vaccines hadn't really started rolling out yet, and then suddenly we were in New Zealand, where we could just go to bars and restaurants. It was it was great for about a week, awesome. for about a week yeah. or so, and then we had to go into isolation down in the port of port city in New Zealand called Tarunga. Um, before we boarded the British government supply ship, which was then a two-week journey on the supply ship. Um, we actually went via Tahiti and picked up a medical medical evacuee. So we had another seven days there waiting, and then we got to Pitcairn. So, yeah, it took a couple of months to get here, a couple of months to get here. Wow. But then since we've been here, yeah, there's been no, there's not been a single case of COVID in, in Pitcairn. So, you know, we've actually sort of waited out the pandemic in a way. Wow, that's awesome. That's so cool. So even though you've had zero COVID, I know you mentioned the boosters. Does that mean you guys have all had your vaccines on the island? Um, how does how does all that work? Yeah. So when when I first got here, there'd been nobody nobody vaccinated, and we didn't get vaccinated. But as I said, I was just rolling out, and there was it's no because we'd really restricted access to the island. There's been no COVID, no vaccine, so people weren't really paying attention. You could actually live in a the rest of the world is suffering from COVID and a day to day here on the island, you didn't even think about it. Um, but eventually the British government wanted to roll out vaccines to all its overseas territories. Um, if we've got a few remote ones, maybe not as remote as Pitcairn, but you know, the remote, the last couple of remote ones were the last ones to do. And the vaccine had to have a, had to get here from a factory in the UK uh, to the port in New Zealand in under 72 hours for it to be able to kept at the right temperature. So the whole logistics chain there oh, of getting right. it from the factory onto planes via, I think it came via Dubai to, to Auckland Airport, clearing customs, getting in a special van, race down to the port, which is a three hour, four hour drive away. Then we had to buy a special vaccine fridge for the, for the boat, take it out of its chiller box, put it in the vaccine fridge for the two week journey to Pitcairn Island. And then when it got here, the policeman and I had to race aboard with a cool box, jump in the long boats, which are kind of primitive affair. And then we sort of, you know, race to the island, stick it on a quad bike and get it to the clinic. And then everybody could get vaccinated. And we got about, a, I think it's 80, 90% vaccination rate on the island. At that time, not everybody got vaccinated wow. because COVID wasn't a threat. 
But now COVID is not going away. The island's got to open up sometime. So we're hoping that when we get manage to get boosters here early next year, that the last few people who weren't vaccinated first time around will also get vaccinated and we can get up to close to 100% vaccinated because we've only got a very small clinic here with very uh, rudimentary medical facilities. So we can't really cope with COVID breaking out here very easily. Absolutely. That's wild. Um, you mentioned opening back up. Are you planning to bring tourism back to the island? What what time timeline are you guys looking at? Yeah, in fact, the Island Council have just been discussing this in the last week or so. So your question is well timed. Um, yeah, tourism is basically the mainstay of the island, apart from the British government, you know, funding that comes through that pays for a few jobs and stuff. Tourism is what they depend on, really. There's no, there's no really notable exports, a bit of honey and a few other things, but it's mainly tourism they rely on. Of course, that's dried up completely, which has economically been really tough for the island. Um, so then you know, people are motivated by that. Once we get the boosters, that's that's what we're using as the as the, part, the point you're after. After we've had the boosters, that's people have had a chance to be vaccinated and get the booster. What more can we do? You know, the island either stays closed forever, or we or we go for it. So that's what the local council have decided recently. That so we're timing that for 31st of March to allow cruise ships to come back. But then we've got to see if any cruise ships do come back. Right. It, right. And real quick on on this point, I I just want to interrupt here. Um, just to clarify, there's no hotels on the island, right? It is a day stop. Correct. No hotels. No hotels. We've got, yeah, okay. but people yeah, offer yeah, homestay in their houses. Stuff. They've got little units. They'll rent out a room and stuff like that. There is no hotels. Got it. Okay. That's cool. So there are 43 people on the island. Um, there have to be some children. What does education look like for a pet care and child? Yeah. If I could swing my camera around, I could show you the school because it's next door. So we've got a school on the island. Um, they they do, do pretty it. well in that we've got three, te three teenage girls at the moment with one teacher and some teaching support. So in terms of numbers, they do pretty well. One teacher for, for three kids and plus the bit of teaching support, they've almost got one-on-one. -on -one. Those girls are currently aged 11, 13, and 14. There are a couple of little kids, little boys, who are currently off the island. Their parents are in New Zealand at the moment. With their, they're in New Zealand with their parents at the moment. They might come back. Uh, they're aged two and four, I think. And that's it for kids on the island. Wow, that's a great ratio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, crazy. You know, they so go the same. They go the same because they all have to be in one class, but they go through the whole of their school life just with two or three other people. Mm -hmm. Right, wow. exactly. Completely different experience than what we're used to. Um, so especially in the, in the last two years now, um, residents haven't traveled extensively. How do residents leave the island? Um, and if not, do you share your travel journeys? Because you yourself have been all over the world. Yeah. Um, so before COVID, and actually going back in time, the Pitkenners have traveled, you get a real mix. You get some people that almost never leave the island um, for years and years. And other people, strangely, have actually been able to travel quite a lot. So, for example, um, because it's an overseas territory, we'll have a, for example, a high level meeting in the UK where the leaders of each overseas territory in the old days, but before COVID, you know, and people travel for meetings and conferences and stuff. Somebody from Pitcairn would travel all the way to the UK and attend a, a conference of overseas territories leaders. So that was quite a journey. Um, other people might go to New Zealand um, or Tahiti for getting some supplies or go for trips. They go for medical trips there, as I said, sometimes as well. Um, but you're right, people don't travel extensively. Very few people have traveled extensively. Um, do I share my stories with them? If I'm honest, not really too much. If they ask, yes, but actually they don't <laughs> ask. They don't ask mostly. Um, you know, if you, when you live in these small communities, the the center of your world becomes that community and what's going on. The rest of the world seems not irrelevant, but if you know what I mean, it's so far away, especially, you know, you look out my window and there's just the Pacific Ocean going for miles and miles and it doesn't, it has no relevance to them. So they don't yes, really ask. Absolutely. They're not really interested. You know, like not you guys so are not It's interesting. They probably right, would be, yeah. but stories, but you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really bear much relevance. That's interesting. Yeah. That is, it's like you guys are in a completely different world. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for us, it's that. living in a completely different world. It seems so alien, <laughs> traveling or you know, living where uh, there's no restaurants here either. I mean, there's no restaurants. There's no bar. Oh, there's one one 
one couple open up their one of their rooms to have drinks in occasionally, but there's no, you know, there's no commercial facilities really. So yes, yeah, wow. certainly out, out, certainly out there. So that being the case, what do you and your wife spend your free time doing? <laughs> um, well. We have quite a lot of free time. So there's a lot of book reading going on. It's reintroducing ourselves oh, yeah. to books has been very pleasant. You know, don't usually get, none of us usually get time to do that. Um, the islands actually, um, in terms of geography, it's got quite a lot of contours. It's not a flat island. It's a, basically like a, a mountain peak and it's got a lot of mountains and valleys. It's only very small, but it's very contorted, which means there's a lot of good walks through jungles and you can appear up on high points and look over the Pacific. Uh, there's a natural pool called St. Paul's Pool, which is just idyllic. You know, you couldn't make it up. It's just a natural, it's on the bay. And it's created almost like a swimming pool where the waves fill it up and it's crystal clear. Oh. You can go swimming in that. You can go kayaking out in the island, do oh. a bit of fishing, walking. There's a place called Christian's Cave where Fletcher Christian used to sit and contemplate before he met his demise at the, the hands of the Tahitian men. Um, and you can climb up there. But these are pretty hairy climbs as well. One slip and that's the end. It's kind of interesting. Yeah. So yeah, it's an easy, easy life, but there's plenty of interesting little things to do. Done a few jigsaws too. <laughs> I'm picturing this beautiful island paradise. Do you guys have the the perfect weather, or do you guys get storms? What is what is your weather like? It's warm almost all the time, um, and mostly sunny. We. The cycles, I mean, there are storms in the Pacific. They don't often hit here for some reason. So mostly it's hot and sticky, um, particularly in the summer, it goes up to 30 odd centigrade. What's that? I don't even know, in the 80, 90s in Fahrenheit. Um, in the winter, it gets down to slightly more temperate, 18 degrees, but it's still pretty warm. I've, I've not, you don't need to wear a long sleeve shirt any time of the year. So you're in shorts most of the year. It's sunny wow. all the time. Wow. That's amazing. You've had the opportunity on Pitcairn that few people will ever experience, both professionally and personally. Um, are there any interesting takeaways from your time there that you want to share with us? Yeah, I mean, I can share stories with you um, and experiences. Um, certainly one thing it's, it's taught me does like all these things, whenever you push yourself and go to some, do something very different, it teaches you to appreciate some of the comforts and realities you have back home, right? Um, that we, mm -hmm. most of us mm -hmm. take for granted in the modern world. I mean, my, I, I, my internet's a bit better now, but it's been bad for a long time and you know, that's a modern luxury. But it's other things, I said, you can't go shopping, you can't get things you wanna get, you can't go to restaurants. So hopefully it'll teach me, I think I, I think I was always pretty good at this, some of the countries I've been in, but again, it reinforces that look at what we've got in some of our societies and how lucky we are to get those things and take them for granted and we shouldn't take them for granted. Um, and the way our governments and our countries function as well, you know, the, this, the public services that you get given and stuff, you know, they don't come with nothing here. We've got to do everything ourselves. You know, if you want water and stuff and plumbing, you've got to put it in yourself and, you know, the islanders do all that, you know, so you get, I think, guess you taught that. Um, if you want an anecdote, I mean, this is not on Pitcairn, but the sort of some of the things I'll remember when I'm here, apart from the stuff I've mentioned already. Um, we did have a, a guy fell overboard from our ship um, earlier this year, which was quite an incredible story, which I will, I'll remember for the rest of my time. He was one of the ship's engineers at like between four and six in the morning, he toppled overboard somehow. He was feeling Ill, unwell and fell overboard in the middle of the night. You can imagine it's dark, nobody else is up. The ship's halfway between New Zealand and Pitcairn. He fell overboard. Um, in just his overalls, um, and the ship sailed off into the distance. Um, I remember I that. I could go to the whole full data of the story, but basically he was in the water for 14 or 16 hours. After about five hours, he, he found a bit of floating plastic debris, which he managed to clutch onto, and he must have given up any hope of survival. But the ship turned around, you know, in the 11 o'clock in the morning, so five hours later it turned around, and it had been trying to fight him all day, just about given up hope when it's at sunset and somebody just heard a plaintive cry on deck and thought, I think I heard something and they turned the ship in that direction and they found this guy and it was just getting dark. So if he'd had to spend another night in the water, he probably wouldn't survive. So a survival story like wow. that, it's, you can look it up on the oh web or something. It's quite incredible. 
and he survived and they dragged him back ashore you know we'd all given up hope but 16 hours in the middle of the pacific so five kilometers straight down thousands of miles that way yeah no ship in the area except the one you were on trying to find you incredible yeah that is uh he's a very lucky man for sure I, yeah. Mark, I know our time is almost up. I um, want to make sure you you, uh, you spend some great time with us and want to make sure I don't take away from your time. I have two last quick questions. What, what is your diet on the island? <laughs> yeah, it's spectacular. It's really good, actually. Um, because that's another thing I guess I've learned as well. We've been growing our own vegetables. My, I've, I'm terrible. My corn crop is terrible though. I've obviously got my season wrong because we had a drought for the last four months and my sweet corn hasn't grown because the previous sweet corn you grew was delicious. But we grow our own um, fruit and vegetables, but it grows all over the island. There's bananas everywhere. We're just coming into avocado season, lychees. So there's mangoes. There's all sorts of things that over the years have come here. So you can get plenty of fruit. Um, vegetables mm -hmm. and tomatoes. The sea is out there, so the locals go fishing quite a lot, um, and they'll be usually pretty generous about giving you fish or, or selling it. I bought some fish and chips, beautifully cooked fish and chips last night. Um, uh, so that's, that's kind of your limit to your local stuff. Uh, we live mostly on that, and then you get staples like rice and lentils and stuff, which we buy in the shop. There's one shop on the island, but it's pretty well stocked. It gets supplies from New Zealand, and so it even has things like bacon and meat and and alcohol and coke and all that sort of stuff, you can get it. Um, personally, again, we don't usually much, you don't need to. It's much better to live off the fresh stuff. Yeah. No Ireland for course. We might have turned means, vegetarian, right? actually. That's a, that's a really sad thing. <laughs> that actually, since we're being here, we're tempted to turn vegetarian now, which I never <laughs> thought I would say. But I think it might be coming. And, and and you know you miss those wings from the Ireland's four courts in Arlington, Virginia. Oh, no, definitely. You uh, yeah. but we'll, You're right. I can't we'll, do it vegetarian. Yeah, we'll have, vegetarian. We'll have some of the, yeah. and, and, and my last question, I'm just curious about this, and it struck me as we were talking. If, if I landed on Pitcairn Island, like I just swam to shore, like would I have to show passport? Would I, could I claim asylum? Like what, what would I be? I, I'm just curious. <laughs> yeah, we've <laughs> actually got... A proper immigration regime here. <laughs> Technically, once you come into our waters, we've got a woman who doubles as the local police officer and the immigration officer. If you were swimming shore, you probably no wouldn't way. have your passport in your pocket. So, so yeah, when cruise ships yeah. land, and people, some people love it. Some tourists, that's where they come to get a Pitcairn Island stamp in their passport. You know, the cruise ships, they'll come ashore, you queue up, and she'll, she'll, climb up, she'll scramble aboard the ship and stamp everybody's passport. Um, so there is, yeah. and we've actually got immigration legislation of who can land, who can't land, all that sort of stuff. But if you just washed up, of course it would be different. People would haul you ashore. They would just, you would just become a local, <laughs> like all the other wow. people that washed That's up a... over the years. So you would, you would and, be, and is, you know, we've got a duty to look after you. Is there a bank? <laughs> There's something called the treasury. Services? So the only, the only facilities are the school, the clinic, um, the shop, the post office and what we call the government treasury, which handles the cash. But it's not really a bank. Okay. Wow. It doesn't really have credit cards yeah. into your banking. So yeah, so locals, what locals can do is they can put money into that treasury. A guy called Kerry runs it. Uh, you give him money and he can, he'll notify, there's a Pitcairn office in New Zealand and they can put the equivalent amount into your bank account if you've got a bank account. Some people don't have bank accounts. Wow, that's amazing. Mark, it was an honor and a privilege to have you on the show. Um, this was really amazing. I don't think we've had quite a guest like this and we might not ever. <laughs> so this is, this is really amazing. It's great to see you. Tell your wife, Maria, I said hello. Uh, and so uh, I'm Steve Burke. And I'm Hannah Nine. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you again on Coffee with Closers. A, B, C. A, always B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. We're the Pinkston team, and this has been Coffee with Closers. Be sure to subscribe for more episodes and follow us on Twitter, TikTok, and LinkedIn. Catch us next time. We know you're not busy.